Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, December 18th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer as usual, oops. Nothing that you hear or see on this video or podcast is to be taken as investment advice. I am not a licensed investment professional. Please take everything that you hear or see as information and to be used for informational entertainment purposes. Please do your own due diligence on any investments that you're planning on making. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Plus, don't forget that I'm just a guy on the internet. Um, I'd like to just say uh, before we get started that, you know, just talking about the markets in general, you know, we're at the end of the year, we have a lot of volatility. It's one of the things I keep harping on, right? Because I continue to get DMs and messages, people asking me what they should do. Like I said, I can't give individual investment advice, but this is pretty typical. I've been pretty consistent since I've started the newsletter and even over the last six months or a year saying that we're going to have a lot of turmoil in the markets. We're going to have a lot of volatility in the markets and that you have to think long term. You have to, as I've said before many times, you have to understand what you own and why you own it. And if those things don't change, it's irrelevant what the price does. The problem is, is that a lot of people are inexperienced. They don't know market history. They don't have conviction in the things that they're investing in because they haven't done the necessary research. And so, or they go, they get overly excited because they hear a narrative or a story. It, you know, creates anxiousness, wanting to get in, FOMO, and they go all in. I don't advocate doing any of those things. And so to reach out to me and ask me what you should do if you just put all your money into one idea at the top at an intermediate top, and then it goes against you, like what happened with a lot of people in uranium. Nothing's fundamentally changed with uranium since I've been talking about it for three years. In fact, the fundamentals continue to get better. Price is going to be volatile. I've demonstrated this multiple times. Please go on the stock charts and look at stocks, the price action of stocks. They have the tools there. Look at the price action of the stocks between 2004 and 2007, which represented the last bull market, there were multiple times that those stocks pulled back 50% or more as they went on to a couple thousand percent returns. If you're not able to understand that, and I can say this right here, but until you experience a 50% drop in a stock, you don't know how you're going to react. You don't know how you're going to react when a tire blows out on the freeway when you're going to 80 miles an hour. If you are trained on how to recover that if you're trained and understand how to uh, what this what the process is to get to this meet meet to the side of the road safely, then you're not going to panic. The problem is people panic. Okay, so that's all I can tell you. Um, nothing's fundamentally changed with many of the things that we're talking about. What the Fed's doing, what you know all these little things that people worry about, they don't have relevance long-term. You won't be able to pick the point, these things out on a long-term chart. So what I'm saying is, uh, and many of these things that we're talking about, they have a cycle that they go through. In many cases, it's a couple year cycle. Just forget about the short-term volatility. And if you have extra capital and the thesis hasn't changed and the fundamentals have got better, you buy more. That's what you do in a bull market when the price goes down. So I just wanted to talk about this. You know, I just said, don't worry about what the Fed says, but I think, think this is interesting because this is kind of what my view is on this. Um, and I'll put, I, I didn't delete them this week, but uh, I have all the uh, reference articles. I will put uh, links to this stuff in the show notes, but this is a hedge fund that was talking about this. And I agree with this thesis. This has kind of been my thesis, you know, if you went back to 2000, the tech wreck, then the housing bubble, every time we have a financial crisis, the Fed steps in and over liquefies the system, which causes uh, second order effects like asset price bubbles and somewhere else. So we've 
created such a bubble now. We have so much debt that, yes, the Fed can talk about raising rates. They can talk about doing all these things. Right now, it's all talk. But can they really raise rates? Can they really get this inflation genie back in the bottle without tanking the markets and the economy? And that's something that a lot of people have been talking about for 20 years, like a guy like Peter Schiff or some of these other guys. Have we reached the end game now where the Fed has no outs? And if they actually proceed with what they're talking about, that they cause, you know, market collapses in the economy to go into a severe recession or deflationary depression. And so I thought this was interesting because this is uh, kind of my, my view now. They can't really ever tighten. They'll talk about it. There will be volatility around this discussions. They can probably raise, you know, a little bit here and there to do some things that are around the edges, but I don't see a full rate hiking cycle. So they're talking about raising rates, what, two or three times next year or four times. So if they do it in quarter points, you get to 2%, your inflation rate still, you still have negative, right? You still have negative real rates. So your inflation is not under control. So I don't know. I think, We'll see how much of the supply chain things rectify themselves, but you know we still haven't seen the full repercussions of the energy crisis that we're entering. Winter, you know, has coming along, and if you and I'll be talking about that in some other slides about what's happening in Europe, which is a total disaster. So, uh, just wanted to go over this real quick. Black Swan Hedge Fund Universal Investments expects lower returns from risk capital, including equity markets, over the next few years due to frothy valuations. That's something else we've talked about. When valuations have become so extreme, we don't necessarily see a big collapse, but you just see zero to like one or 2% returns for a decade or longer. If you want to talk about Japan, 30 years with no real, real re good, decent returns. But the risk mitigation specialist said, quote, a shocking percentage of the rise in markets since 2008 has been entirely artificial. Yeah, it's been because of the Fed providing liquidity. It's not because of some genius or a new era in the economy or you're some kind of great investor. Uh, liquidity has been created in the trillions and trillions, and it's went into the stock market. It's created the, a bubble of epic proportions, not just in, in the stocks, but in many asset classes. It goes on to say, the Fed is truly driving the ship into the iceberg and is the greatest driver of the fragility today. That's exactly right. You see how much emphasis was put on the recent discussions about the taper and the possible rate increases and the volatility that's happened. And if you look outside the top stocks in the S&P, the FANG stocks, if you will, the main five or six stocks, if you look at the underlying market, there are quite a few stocks and a lot of the ones that were market darlings last year that are down 40, 50, 60% or more. And you know, look at a company like Peloton, or some of these other companies, they're getting creamed. But it's being masked because you have so much uh, so much money in the top companies, they skew the, the index higher. It's masking what's happening in the underlying market. Goes on to say, I do not believe the Fed can ever truly tighten again. Yes, they might be able to raise rates, but to get to tighten and get real positive rates when you have a 6.8% inflation rate means you have to raise rates above that. There's no way the economy could take 7 or 8% interest rates, a Fed funds rate, uh, to get real rates to the point where they need to be to deal with this situation. The economy would collapse. The markets would collapse. We've just come too far in the forest. It's too much of a tinderbox now. That's exactly right. So I think that this will be a decade of higher than above inflation. I'm not saying it's going to go to hyperinflation. I don't think that's likely, but we're going to be in a situation where we're going to have higher inflation than we thought. And the Fed's ability to deal with it is going to be curtailed because they do not want to be in a situation where they crash the economy of the markets. And so in a situation like that, you have to look back in history of what asset classes did the best in real assets in a negative interest real rate world where you have higher than normal inflation, real assets is what does well, not these high flying stocks with no earnings and you know 
that's that just doesn't do well during this time frame that we're entering, which I believe will last many years. Now we're going to have quite a bit of volatility. There's going to be massive pullbacks. We saw the recent volatility in the last month or two. You're going to continue to see that. But uh, I still believe that over the course of this decade, at least, we are going to see real assets and resources, resource stocks outperform. That's my view. So you can see here, UK electricity prices go parabolic. This is Great Britain front month base load electricity futures price daily in pounds per megawatt hour, 490 pounds. This is on Friday or Thursday or Friday, uh, the 16th, so that'd be Thursday, I guess. I mean, look at this spike. And look, it's not just been a phenomenon of just the last couple of days. I mean, the spike has went tremendously higher because of the fact that, uh, you know, the choices that these governments have made over the last decade or so on their energy policy is now coming home to roost. And quite frankly, if the prices stay at these levels and we're going to see massive cold next week in Europe in midweek, we should see uh, another huge cold spell. And this isn't just in Great Britain. This is all across Europe. Um, and it's a lot of poor choices where um, an emphasis was put on renewables, an emphasis was put on demonizing and restricting fossil fuels, uh, dumb policy decisions like not turning Nord Stream 2 on, which we'll talk about later also. And it's all coming home to roost. And I, I can guarantee you that if you think inflation is going to be transitory, how will it be transitory when energy, as I've said before many times, permeates every product, every service, everything that we do, everything that we buy. So all these costs will go in, they will find their way into all these products and further exacerbate the situation that we're already seeing, which is higher than normal inflation. So this does not bode well. So here's Oli Hansen from Saxo Bank, the commodities guy there. Europe gas and storage some 21% below the five-year average as the level breaks below 700 terawatt hours roughly one month earlier, earlier than in previous years. So what they're saying is, you know, you build gas up in storage over the summer and spring to prepare for the winter heating season. And what they're saying is, is that you're now at a level of gas storage a month earlier than you typically have been in the past. And like I said, You've restricted production. They don't allow fracking in Europe. You're antagonizing and demonizing the Russians, which who you've who you've tied yourself to over, because of your poor decisions making in gas and energy policy. And so you can see why you're having this type of situation. You know, this this does not look good. This your storage was not built up sufficiently. We know why. We've talked about it in the past because of the Russians not sending the necessary gas to Europe, and now you're at a situation on the drawdowns where you're at a situation where your uh, drawdown is a month earlier than it typically is over the five year average. This is not going to end well. I think. Uh, I think the Europeans should really pray for a for a mild winter, and if they don't get it. A lot of people are going to be in for a world of hurt. We've already seen curtailments in industry in places that are very energy intensive, metals, refining and smelting, fertilizer production, the things that require natural gas as an input. None of these things, these are second order effects that these governments didn't take into account. And so what's interesting about these politicians is they never have to say they're sorry and they never have to be accountable for their poor policies. And I would suggest to you that if things get bad enough, which I believe they will over this decade with energy and food, you're going to see massive changes in governments all around the world. You're going to have a lot of, that's more volatility, more turmoil. So I put this together here. Europeans, remember, your politicians caused you to freeze this winter. And so you have a new government in Germany, right? German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is facing pressure at the European Union summit in Brussels to block the Nord Stream 2 pipeline as a way to punish Russia for recent aggressions. You know, I'm not going to get into Russia, Ukraine issue. I have my own views on it. I don't, you know, I don't have any issue with what Russia is doing. There's no aggression. 
okay? Uh, the self-determination of Russian-speaking people in Eastern Ukraine means they wanna have closer ties to Russia. You, if you don't understand what's happening in Kiev with the governments there and over the last few years, demonizing Russians, demonizing the Russian-speaking peoples, of course, this is what they're going to uh, ask. They're, they're going to want to be have closer ties to people that are ethnically and linguistically uh, like them. So if you've ever been to Ukraine, it's a basket case, okay? It has pockets of wealth like in Kiev and other large cities. And, but in the rural areas and in a lot of the provincial cities, it's still like third world, second world type conditions. Why would Russia want to invade Ukraine and take on all that burden? That doesn't make any sense. What they don't want is Ukraine joining NATO and then NATO putting troops and missiles on their border. That's what they don't want. And I think that's perfectly reasonable considering the history of Russia, which I don't have time to get into. But what I don't understand is that if you are going to put yourselves uh, in Europe's case, Western Europe's case, in a situation policy-wise where you have restricted all other types of energy and are now reliant on Russian gas, why you're doing things to demonize that uh, makes no sense to me. So Schultz recently pledged to support the inviolability, inviol whatever, of Ukraine's border, but is facing pressure from Eastern European countries to deter a Kremlin invasion. As I said, there's not going to be a Kremlin invasion unless uh, we, we, we could pursue this policy of uh, uh, pushing to have NATO on the borders of Russia. They're not going to tolerate it. Okay, it's that simple. That's the line in the sand. I think it's perfectly reasonable. I don't see, yeah, of course they put troops on the border. Why wouldn't they? Okay, if you want to play Escalante with the Russians, the Europeans are in no position to have a land war with Russia over Ukraine. And certainly, I agree with uh, Matt Gates in our Congress. This has no, what's going on in Ukraine has no bearing on anybody in the middle class of this or lower classes or working classes in the US. Who cares? It's not our problem. It's not gonna affect anybody here one iota. And yet you have the pointy shoes, the masters of the universe, didn't learn their lesson in Iraq, didn't learn their lesson in Afghanistan, and now we want to crank it up with Russia. Well, Russia and China and Iran and these type of countries, now you're hunting big game. So you're going to have, what, a land war or some kind of limited nuclear exchange with the Russians over Ukraine? Who cares? The pro uh, goes on here. The project, talking about Nord Stream 2, according to its website, states the pipeline will transport natural gas from Russia through the Baltic Sea and into Germany to meet the Europeans' rapidly declining domestic gas production, which is true, which they're further restricting with their stupid mandates and laws. And as I just showed you, look at the inventories. Look where they are on the five-year average. If they don't have a warm winter in Europe, they're going to freeze to death. A lot of people are going to freeze to death. And so you're going to blame it on Russia? I don't think you're going to get away with that, EU politicians. But you know, keep taking your advice from the United States. You know, the United States makes out like a bandit on this, right? Because we don't want to compete against Gazprom. We want to sell gas to Russia or to uh, Western Europe and China and all these people via LNG. So, of course, you know, does that have something to do with it? Absolutely. Does this, you know, what's this foreign policy we're pursuing against Russia and China? It makes no sense. Like I said, you're not going to be fighting some uh, third world country. You're going to be fighting you know, big game on their back on their back door. I don't think that's going to end well. And like I said, what European armies are there? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still uh, trying to get over this cold that I had head cold. It's still got me congested. So the bottom line is it doesn't look like the Russians are going to be able to bail out um, or the European politicians aren't going to allow Russia to even try to bail out uh, this problem that they have with lack of gas. But uh, enough people freeze, enough people are inconvenienced, enough jobs are lost, then the political class will pay the price. So here we go. When I talk about the stupid policy decisions, here's another one. EU to stop funding oil and natural gas pipelines. The European Union plans to stop funding new oil and gas pipelines in the future as it switches the focus to promoting energy sources that are less harmful to the climate. Here we go again. Oh, it just never ends. And yet Germany shutting down their nuclear plants. I mean, I don't know. 
I, I don't have to really comment. The, the, the narrative writes itself. If you are a logical thinking person, you know this isn't going to work. This is going to be very bad. You know, the, the EU is in terminal decline. These countries are ridiculous. Uh, I don't mean to pick on the individual people there. I'm not doing that, but these governments are ridiculous. The whole thing's a, a, a big, colossal, ridiculous narrative that it doesn't work, cannot work, will not work. It's going to come unwound, okay? That's my. That's another thing that's going to happen over the next next decade. The whole EU is just going to come apart at the seams because the whole thing doesn't make any any sense. And these types of decisions are just going to hasten it. The revised regulation sets new priorities in energy production in order to achieve the EU's climate goals with the aim of promoting electricity grids, oh boy, lines to offshore wind farms and for climate friendly gases such as hydrogen. Uh, I've went over all this before, so I'm not going to go over why none of this is going to work like they think it will. Uh, if you don't understand, you know, hydrogen isn't naturally occurring. You have to produce it from natural gas or coal or something like this. Um, it's very energy intense. I don't, uh, this isn't going to work. And then uh, lines to offshore wind farms. We don't have enough copper already. I showed the uh, slide last couple of weeks ago. It showed the size of the uh, cables. I mean, the whole thing, it's just not going to work. But people are going to have to learn the hard way. That just seems what's going to have to happen. New projects exclusively using fossil oil or natural gas may no longer receive EU support in the future. The other thing that I find amusing on this is that the whole renewable push has to be based in, in, in the production and the construction and all those things is based on fossil fuels. So none of this makes any sense. It has nothing to do with sense. It's a religion now. It's gotten to the level of a cult thing and the only thing that breaks it is starvation and freezing in the in the dark uh at some point people wake up well, when they're completely really really inconvenienced and that is coming to many countries around the world that are adopting these ridiculous policies so here's an interesting uh slide u.s oil demand hits all-time high for this time of year U.S. implied oil demand on a four-week basis hit an all-time high this week, which is interesting because typically this we're in the shoulder season and demand should be less than uh, typical. So uh, this is compared, obviously, to previous periods during this calendar, part of the calendar, but we're at a all-time high, which is interesting considering variants and all these other things that were supposed to derail energy demand. Jet fuel demand remains below the historical averages, making the all-time high demand reading that much meaningful. Correct. Because as jet fuel demand comes back, as air travel continues to increase, <coughs> we will exceed the all-time highs. That's the uh, inference here. And I'll put a link to the article because it references some charts here, but it's a pretty good article on Seeking Alpha, another person I follow uh, that does a lot of analysis on the uh, oil markets, HFIR, I, I forget what the what that stands for, but it's on Seeking Alpha and Twitter. You can see a large spike in propane and propylene demand. Distillate fuel oil is also very strong with residual oil moving higher as well. Gasoline is right at the norm and jet fuel demand remains below the historical averages. If jet fuel demand recovers, IEA will be wrong not just once, but twice. Not only is it not factoring in OECD demand already back to 2019 levels, but it's double dipping the jet fuel demand assumption. Once jet fuel demand recovers in 2022, this will magnify the miss by IEA on the demand side. So that's been part of the narrative that we have, of the two-part narrative that we are hanging our energy hats on for the next couple of years. First of all, that, uh, Oil demand is being understated because of these woke or these politically captured agencies and stuff that, you know, the oil demand is going to go away because of the green transition. They've infected themselves with this irrational thinking and made assumptions and proclamations based on that. And in fact, the facts are that oil demand is coming back. We're now exceeding the pre pandemic levels and it's going to continue to grow as long as we don't have like, you know, a big reset worldwide recession which isn't currently being forecasted and so you just have this happening in the oecd countries which are the mostly developed countries what's happening in the emerging markets well you know their demands coming back too and it's going to continue to grow 
And so that's the demand side. Supply side, we already have talked about many, many times why it's restricted, why it continues to be restricted because of lack of investment, ESG, demonization, the fossil fuels, yada, yada, yada. And so again, the narrative is incorrect. So we have to find the position or the narrative that's incorrect and bet against it. And I think this is it for 2022. I think that uh, the energy markets are going to perform very well over this decade. And like I've said before, we're hurtling towards an uh, all-time highs in oil at some point in our future if we continue to ignore reality and facts, which does not appear to be changing anytime soon from what I can see. So here we go again. Here's another government, right? Um, this one in Israel. Uh, Israel will halt its... Not, now, Israel, tiny country, not a lot of space. They were fortunate over the last decade or so, they found tremendous, huge offshore natural gas deposits. Um, one of them is called Leviathan, as a matter of fact. That's how big it is. And there was a view that these natural gas deposits were going to help Israel become energy self-sufficient, not dependent on bringing imports in from Egypt. I mean, this has all kinds of national security um, uh, implications, right? And policy implications and goes just beyond, you know, lowering CO2, which seems to be the new cult among a lot of left-wing governments or progressive governments. So they had a change in government in Israel. So of course, this is what the energy minister there and the government there has decided to do. They will halt its natural gas search and production in 2022 to make room for renewable energy resource use. Energy Minister Karen Elahar, I don't know how to pronounce her name, announced on Wednesday. You should take a look at her in the images. She just looks like a total progressive. She's, of course, handicapped in a wheelchair, hits all the, hits all the numbers, you know, hits all the little bases they need. So this is what uh, they're going to do. Quote, in the coming year, we will focus on the future, on green energy, on energy optimization, and on renewable energy. And while we do so, we will put aside the development of natural gas, which, as is known, is short-term solution, she said. Yeah, well, I wish you luck with this. You know, to have solar energy, to have wind energy, takes a lot of space. Israel is a little rinky-dink country that doesn't have a lot of space. So I'm not sure how they're going to do this. I haven't delved into it. Maybe they're just going to have them all over the rooftops and top of every building and out in the desert. I don't know what they're going to do, what their plans are. But I would suggest to you that this probably is not going to work. She goes on to say, every shekel or, mo or minute of attention paid to the advancement of the minerals gas industry will come at the expense of advancing renewable energy projects that we so desperately need. Given Israel's deplorable state of affairs and in international comparison, our systematic failure to meet targets so far and the climate crisis. Okay, good luck with that. So what I'm trying to show you here is I'm not going to pick on Israel. I'm just showing you government after government around the world following these stupid policies that aren't going to work. And the people there, you know, these are ostensibly democracies. This is what people want. They've been conditioned. They've been educated in the government schools. They've been propagandized that this is where we need to go. Okay. And that's where we're going to head. And you're going to suffer the consequences. This is why I keep saying that energy is probably going to create generational wealth for people that get it. Reality will assert itself whether you want it to or not. Okay, that's about as plain as I can put it. Reality doesn't care what you want, what you think should happen. It only is going to happen. And I will suggest to you that people will go along with all this until their standard of living is reduced and harmed, and then there will be changes in these governments. It's just that simple. Okay, and we haven't got to the point where the pain has been sufficient, but it is coming for many, many people around the world. And what's funny is, you know, you have the emerging markets, you have China and Russia that pay lip service to all this crap. And they're laugh, They're going to laugh all the way to the bank. There's no issues with the power of Siberia pipeline going into China. That gas is flowing. China's building all kinds of coal plants. They don't care what people in the West think, okay? Um, they're going to have energy security. They just expanded, you know, their build out for nuclear power. 
which is one of our main thesis of the Chinese build out of why uranium is going to go to all time highs in the next few years. And so you have to watch things for what they are and not what you think. So a lot of some people will come on here and watch these videos. And they don't like it because they have bought into this whole thing and this they believe this is what should happen. And they can believe whatever they want. Energy prices are going higher. So you can sit there and not take advantage of it. And, you know, or you can realize that, you know, you can buy into it and still get rich because it's going to happen regardless. You cannot restrict supply of fuels that enable civilization and then think civilization is going to continue. It simply isn't going to happen. And I suggest like I go back to one of my first podcast interviews with Malcolm Rawlingson, when I asked him, what do you think it would take to finally get people to wake up? And he said, their standard of living going down massively. And we're starting, we're at the front end of that happening. Okay. And as that happens, people are going to get very upset because reality is going to assert itself. I titled this slide, it's okay, Solar. We know you are doing your best. So we just talked about all these nonsensical things that these various governments are doing. This is what they're putting their hope on. And you can see, this is just physics and astronomy and math. You know, the earth as it rotates around the sun goes through seasons, right? The earth is on an axis and it tilts as it goes around and the northern hemisphere is in summer, the southern hemisphere is in winter and vice versa. In the winter, you have less solar energy reaching the earth. The sun comes up later in the day and goes down sooner and its position on the uh, relative to the horizon is lower. So therefore, as you see in the winter months and early spring and early fall, you have the amount of solar irradiation goes through a cycle. This is what you're going to power a modern economy on. And so the idea is, well, we'll just build all these panels. What, who's building the panels? China with coal. I mean, these people, there's no thinking involved. It's just a cult, folks. It's not going to work. Okay. And, you know, how many, so it's just the mathematics, the amount of minerals that are needed is just impossible. And this just is not going to work. Instead of just having, you know, base load nuclear that just goes like this across, supplies the same base load coal, base load nat natural gas, this is what they're going to base the industrial societies on. It's not going to work. Okay. These are not John's opinions. This is physics, this is astronomy. This is math, and you can choose to ignore that. You will be poor. This is, you know, we talk about the supply situation. Saudi's largest oil field, oh, I misspelled field, sorry, in terminal decline, I asked the question. Gawar, which is the largest uh, Saudi oil field, you should read the book by Matt Simmons. He died about 10 years ago after he wrote the book but it was called Twilight in the Desert. It talks about the Saudi Arabian oil fields. It talks about uh, how Saudi Aramco and OPEC hides or doesn't fully report what's really going on with their oil fields. And Gawar is the largest field in Saudi Arabia. It provides half of Saudi production and the thing's in terminal decline. And what do I mean by that? I'm not gonna get into all the geotechnical terms, but suffice to say, I'll put a link to this uh, Twitter feed uh, because this gives some good information. But I suggest you read that book because that was like a peak oil book. That was a popular situation or um, narrative that was popular. And then when shale came along, it kind of dissipated that narrative as shale kind of covered up the declines from the rest of the world, right? And now shale has, we went through our little shale decade. And now I think a lot of these geophysical properties that were in place are going to reassert themselves on the supply side. And so it says, Gawar, we have a problem. Water cuts keep increasing. No place to infill, drill more wells and 70 plus years of oil production history means Arabian granddaddy Gawar is in terminal decline. So what you're talking about on water cuts is this. As you develop an oil field, it has natural pressure that pushes, pushes the oil and gas to the surface. 
okay? As the field is produced, it begins to lose this pressure. It uh, begins to lose the ability of the inherent properties of the source rock and sands, the overpressurization to push the hydrocarbons to the surface. And so they have developed because this industry has been around for a hundred years, techniques. One of them is called water flooding. You pump water down one hole and it pushes the oil, incre increases the pressure and pushes the oil up another hole. What happens is though, as you produce that oil and you, you get that oil out of the hole, you start increasing more and more water as a percentage of your oil that you're pulling out, right? So they use oily water separators. So you may originally start, when you start doing a water flood, you might start doing like, you might get, I don't know the exact terms, I'm not a petroleum engineer, but suffice to say, you could get 90% oil, 10% water, then it just keeps increasing over time, right? Because these fields are not inexhaustible. They have a certain amount of petroleum in them. And so these are very technical things that they're doing. They can actually damage the fields. This is why when Saudi Arabia says it can open up the taps and do this, they really can't because you have to be careful when you're doing these types of operations, these water floods or these CO2 injections, all these different techniques that you don't, you can, you have the potential to damage the field. So the suggestion is, is that, you know, there's nowhere else to go here on this field. The water cuts, you're getting less oil and more water. And is this actually being discussed? What's the real situation? And like I said, this thing is, if it's in terminal decline, you should look at the situation what happened with the large field in Mexico, Cantarell offshore. When it started to decline over a period of like five or six years, it went into like a collapse. It declined like 80 or 90%. Uh, basically turned Mexico into a pretty decent oil exporter into I think a net oil importer, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to check those facts, but suffice to say, Mexico doesn't have the same stroke in the oil markets that it did since Cantarell collapsed. So the question being, we have growing demand. Demand is back to 2019 pre-pandemic levels. It's growing. And we have this questions all around supply, natural declines along with ESG and government stupidity doing everything it can to, to restrict supply. If you don't understand that this means higher oil prices, then I can't help you at this point. So here's something else we've been talking about. You know, we've talked about in previous weeks, in previous months, as OPEC Plus has increased its production, uh, 400,000 barrels a day per month since August going into the end of this year. What we've seen is many of the OPEC members inability to meet the new quotas. They're not doing that because they they're, they want to help everybody or they want to make the price go up. They can't meet it because of the investments or lack of investments or lack of maintenance or just natural declines that are happening in their oil fields. And so we're seeing more of this. So here's Russia, you know, which is I think behind us the second largest oil producer kind of goes back and forth between us and them. I think it's that uh, they're the second largest oil producer. Crude and condensate output increased by less than 0.3% in the first two weeks of December compared with the daily average in all of November, suggesting producers are edging closer to the limits of spare capacity. So this is what I have suggested is probably going to cause a step change and a narrative change in the oil market, if not in 2022, most likely in 2023. That being a real focus on what the world can actually produce. And that once I think the market and the sediment and the narrative change goes to, well, oil, oil we don't really need to worry about oil supply because we're gonna have a green revolution and oil and gas is gonna go away to no, we need oil and gas. And oh, by the way, we don't necessarily have enough capacity now. There are many analysts, several analysts that I follow that I respect their opinion. Gordon and Rosenzweig have said this too. We could be in a situation late next year, or early 2023, where the demand for oil exceeds the pumping capabilities of the world. If you get into that situation, we will have record oil prices because price will have to rise to a sufficient level, well over $100 a barrel, to ration demand. 
okay? I, that's the thesis that I am currently under, that demand will continue to increase. We will reach a point where the ability to meet that demand will not be available worldwide and the price will rise sufficiently to ration that demand. Um, whether or not supply can respond and fill that gap, I don't know. What will be the new equi equilibrium price? I do not know. But I am looking past the recent volatility in the oil markets. I'm looking at the facts on the ground. We've shown it's not just one country. We have stupid politicians restricting supplies. We have natural decline. We have lack of investment, yet we have demand that is continuing to relentlessly grow. It's just economics, macroeconomics 101 supply demand curve intersection. Okay. And so the, as I've said before, if your demand is 100 million barrels a day, you know, that next barrel of demand over that, that price of that barrel determines the price for the other, that incremental barrel, right, of demand that cannot be met will determine the price for all the other barrels. That's how these commodity markets work. So that's the view that I'm on. That's the thesis that I'm operating under. Um, there is tremendous value still in a lot of the oil stocks. The cash flows are huge because the current sediment and narrative is, is that we don't need oil and gas. It's going away. And people are being precluded, a lot of pension funds, university endowments, all these banks, all these people, insurance companies that they aren't going to invest in because of their ESG man mandates in these companies. This is like the, going to be, in my view, quite possibly the biggest transfer of wealth in the history of mankind. Now, eventually these people will come around, but it's going to take a tremendous amount of pain. And I'm just still amazed at the prices that you can get for a lot of these companies. You know, the other thing to note is as this inflation continues higher and rates don't rise to match that, there's going to be a tendency to want to look at companies or industries that can cash flow and give you a ability to stay ahead of inflation. And we have noted on several occasions that in previous periods of, it, of longer term endemic inflation in economies that energy easily outperforms most other asset classes. So I keep talking about it week after week. People are probably getting bored about it. People are probably getting sick of me saying the same thing, but I just don't, this is like the best risk reward that I have on the board right now. And uh, the, the data, the news reports, I don't wanna get into a confirmation bias, but everything that I keep seeing keeps, keeps pushing us to this, this particular outcome, forecasted outcome. So here's an Eric, uh, Eric Nuttall article. Uh, I think it's tremendous. It kind of just sums up what we've been talking about, what I just said. He does a little bit better and more eloquently and more to the point. But the title of the article, which I'll put in a link to the show notes, why I am excited about small Canadian energy stocks for 2022. It goes on to say in the article, every day headlines and stories reinforce my thesis that oil is in a multi-year bull market. A growing population and rising standards of living combined with the lack of alternatives to oil in the short term in the transportation sector suggests demand for the economy for the commodity will continue to grow for years to come. Yet, enormous environmental, social, and governance, or ESG pressures on companies to decarbonize, combined with investors' demand for oil companies to return capital back to them, rather than use it for drilling, suggests that meaningful supply growth going forward is massively challenged. And it comes at a time when OPEC is set to exhaust its spare capacity in the next year. The result, a looming oil supply crunch in the next several years, resulting in all-time high oil prices. That just about sums it up, guys. Um, I'll put a link to the article, link to the rest of the articles, but um, use this recent volatility. As Rick Rule says, use volatility. Let the margin clerk that forced these prices down, the tax loss selling, let it be your friend. If you understand the thesis, if you can conceptualize and find this logical, what people like Eric Nuttall are saying, what I've been saying, and you think that energy stocks are undervalued, then you have to be buying them. 
And uh, we point those out in the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. We have some tremendous values. I've got a stock in there that has consistently uh, doing well field development. Their production is now at 20,000 barrels a day. And if you forecast out, even at current oil prices, that, comp that particular company will cash flow its current market cap next year. So you're going to have a company that will have one times cash flow that uh, opens up tremendous opportunities for that company to return capital to shareholders via stock buybacks and dividends. And so we don't, in many cases, one of the things I just want to sum this up with, we don't need oil prices to go to new highs. The current oil price is sufficient to drive tremendous returns in these companies. If the generalist investor will not return, if people will not invest in these companies, these companies are not drilling a lot of new wells. They're going to buy back their own shares. They'll just buy themselves back. And so they've said that on conference call after conference call after conference call. That is what shareholders want. The owners of the company want capital return. They don't want meaningful drilling to take place. They don't want people to go out and waste money on that. Now, that's not 100% across the board, but that's what we're seeing as a consensus. So that's not a recipe for, you know, when we do get higher oil prices, uh, this is going to get solved in six months or so. So I think this, like I said, this is a tremendous opportunity. If you recognize it, if you can recognize it, um, there are negative aspects. Yes, we could have a worldwide recession. We could have, uh, you know, this the, the inflation gets out of control. We are seeing a tightening cycle. Countries are starting to raise rates, starting to tighten liquidity. We'll have to keep an eye on that. But I think in the end, all roads lead to inflation, right? We've talked about that at the start of this start of this uh, particular video that, yeah, they can talk about raising rates, but how far are they really going to go? Because the debts are so huge. Now, the ECB said this week they are not going to raise rates anytime soon. So you have to look at this in totality and not individually, but I think everything's setting up for us to have a tremendous year in energy stocks next year. All right, guys, uh, that's it for this week. Appreciate the uh, patronage, the viewership. And uh, we'll be talking to you. Well, I might do it. Well, next week's Christmas. Uh, I'll still get a video in one way or another, but uh, we'll talk to you next week.